We're now going to move on to this big multi-part question that leads off question six. So before we start to have a look at the solutions, let's just get a sense of the overall question and try and sense like what direction is it headed in and how can all the parts all fit together. So it begins like this. Using the exponential form of a complex number, so we've seen before that different forms of complex numbers are more suitable for solving different kinds of problems or proving different kinds of results. The particular result being focused on in this question, part one is, show that z times its conjugate, z bar, is equal to uh, the modulus of z all squared, and hence simplify z plus w uh, and z plus w bar. So you can see there's a clear parallel between uh, this here, which is the product of a complex number, z plus w, with its conjugate, uh, compared to this result over here, where it's the same thing, it's just z, z bar, instead of z plus w, z plus w bar, okay? So there's the first thing, let's keep on moving and see if we can understand, you know, this is the kind of thing that I use reading time for, to understand how all the different parts of the question fit together, because of course, when you're solving something, you wanna know um, the trajectory and where you're gonna take it, because that's often very useful for what you're gonna do beforehand. It then says, using the rectangular form of a complex number, so now we're switching gears here, show that, and then there, here's another result to do with, again, uh, complex numbers and conjugates, uh, but it's a bit of a, a mismatch thing, right? So you can see it's not a complex number times its own conjugate, it's uh, times the conjugate of some other number, and then you can see another pairing here that apparently is equal to two times the real component of, uh, you know, this, this number over here. So that's going to be the second part. And then prove that, uh, you know, the modulus of z is greater than or equal to the real part of z. So these all seem like preamble, right? Um, none of these seem to explicitly anyway connect to one another. There's no kind of like hence or otherwise. Um, each of these seems to be kind of the setup for what we can see is about to happen in the last two parts of the question. Then there's this diagram and this little uh, paragraph that introduces the triangle inequality. So it's called the triangle inequality because when you've got three sides in a triangle like this, um, you can see if this is Z, uh, and this is W, then Z plus W is, is here. So you've got your different moduli that represent what, what's going on. And uh, because you've got three sides in a triangle, in order for the sides to connect, uh, just suppose you know you had lengths like, oh, I don't know, three and five, and then you'd say, oh, I wonder what is the length in here, right? You know that this length in here cannot possibly exceed the sum of the two other sides. It couldn't be, say, nine, uh, because if you tried to do nine, then how would you even create such a triangle? You have to go three, and then the furthest to the next side I could go is five, so that three plus five gives you eight. There's no way you could attach a third side to that which has a length of nine because they wouldn't match up, right? Um, they wouldn't connect together. All the vertices would never have any way of joining and, uh, sorry, all the lengths would have no way of joining and forming vertices. So you can't have a triangle, right? So that's why this inequality tells us this length here, which is modulus of z plus w, has to be less than or equal to uh, the modulus of z plus the modulus of w. So that's these two shorter sides over here, as it were. So that's why you've got the illustration here. Let's just get rid of this, we don't need that construction. What do we then have to do with this triangle inequality? Well, what we want to do is to prove this result, prove that the modulus of z plus w is less than or equal to mod z plus mod w, using all these parts that we just mentioned up above. Um, can we prove that, uh, you know, this inequality here, let's just highlight it in a different color. We want to prove this inequality, and what we want to do is see these pieces all fitting in parts one, two, and three, to go into this particular result. Um, and it's worth noticing, by the way, the triangle inequality, the way I've introduced it, seems like it's just to do with like plain geometry, just like Euclidean geometry. Um, and so there is a version of the triangle inequality which looks much the same, um, but it's for real numbers. And the fact that I'm asking you to do it for complex numbers is part of why we need to prove it using all of these complex pieces, as it were. Uh, and then lastly, part five, uh, before we actually get stuck into the solution, says the integer side lengths of a triangle are given by these three particular algebraic expressions. Use the triangle inequality, this guy here, to find the least and greatest possible values of x. So the whole idea is, here's the structure of the question, 
set up here in parts one to three to prove the triangle inequality. Then in part four, we reprove it. And then in part five, we use it. We apply it to this particular problem. So we've got all the pieces in our head. Now we're ready to read uh, the solution together. So here's part uh, one of 6a. Um, you can see what I've done is as the question specified, I have got the uh, exponential form of a complex number. So I've got r e to the i theta, r e to the negative i theta. So I'm going to pause right here and just uh, point out that one of the common errors in this question was students uh, erroneously saying, well, I'm just going to let z equal to i uh, e to the i theta, right? Now this could be a complex number, or it probably is, uh, but the point is that I have no r specified out here, which means r is locked into being equal to one. So this can't just be any arbitrary complex number. This is only complex numbers on the unit circle. So anyone who did this, number one, they simplified what was going on here because these values here just became one, so it's trivially simple. Um, but in addition to that, um, you know, you're limiting, this is not true for all complex numbers, it's just true for some of them, and that's the problem. Problem, right? So once you, if you were to do it correctly and set it up as r e to the i theta and r e to the negative i theta, because of our um, index laws here, I've got a common base, namely e, and then I've got these two indices which therefore just add together. So you can see that's why I just get zero there because i theta minus i theta is zero. So you've got it multiplying by one in here, I suppose we could write that. That's what e to the zero is equal to. And r squared is by definition um, the modulus of z. So you've got uh, rather the modulus of z all squared. So that's why you can see I've replaced it with mod z squared as required. And then what I've done is I've said, well, if that's what z, z bar equals, this term here, then what I can do is I can substitute in z plus w into where I saw z here, here, and here. So there's z plus w, there's its conjugate, and there is its modulus squared. So there's result one proved. Result two, we get asked to move into rectangular form. So here is me introducing z and w as two different uh, complex numbers in rectangular form. a plus ib, c plus id, you could have called them x plus i, y, so long as I've got my real and imaginary components, components separate. Uh, in this case, what I need to prove is this result here to do with uh, z w bar, whoopsie daisy, z w bar plus z bar w, right? So what I then do is I say, well, what, what is each of these terms individually? Can I substitute each of them um, and then, you know, multiply through? So you can see here, when I do z w bar, um, there are some terms that are the same as z bar w and some terms that are opposite in signs. So um, these ones here, a c and a c, they're the same. I've got bd, bd, uh, and then you've also got, uh, I'll do it in red here, minus ad matching with plus ad and plus ibc matching with minus ibc. So you can see when I add together line one with line two or equation one with equation two, these red underlined terms they just disappear, so that's why there are no imaginary bits here. Um, and then I get to two outside of AC plus BD, and that by definition, if you have a look, uh, it's because I highlighted up above in orange, AC plus BD, that is the real component of ZW bar. You can see those are the bits with no eyes attached to them. So that's why I can do this, this substitution in here because I can see the AC and the BD up above, okay? So that's result two. Proved. We're still laying foundations at the moment. Let's have a look at result three. Now, this one here was done quite poorly, and that's because there was some real, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Some real technical accuracy and precision required in your use of notation and in your algebraic manipulation. So let's step through step, uh, one step at a time. Um, it probably helps if we remember what does the question say, because we've gone a fair way into the question at the moment. We want to prove that the modulus of z is greater than or equal to the real part of z. Now, a lot of people wanted to make a, um, a fairly intuitive argument for this, um, and that would have been fine if, for example, you'd drawn a diagram that could really back you up on this. But in most cases, a lot of people fell off the train because they tried to use algebra incorrectly. Let me try and explain what I mean. We want to start with understanding what is uh, the modulus of z in relation to the real part of z. How can I get that into play? Well, what I do is I just write out, like this is how we calculate the modulus of z just using Pythagoras. So it's the square root of the horizontal component, vertical component, you know, real and imaginary. And then I notice that y is a real number. And this is really 
<laughs> pardon the pun, this is really, really important. Lots of people didn't mention this, right? They just went straight to saying, well, uh, y squared has to be greater than or equal to zero. That, you know, it's, it's a square, so therefore it has to be greater than or equal to zero, um, and then off I go. But this is only true because y is a real number. If y wasn't real, if y were a complex number, then its square doesn't necessarily have to be greater than or equal to zero. That's kind of the entire point of this topic of complex numbers, that we can square things and they end up negative. That's the whole jam of a complex number, or imaginary number specifically. So if you did not make any mention of this, then you were kind of making this logical claim that uh, y squared is greater than or equal to zero, but you were not backing it up because we are in a sphere of mathematics, a field of mathematics where we know some numbers get squared and are negative, right? So this had to be, this substantiation for this claim was very important. Now, since y squared is greater than or equal to zero, when you include it in here, it can only possibly make this term underneath the square root sign, x squared plus y squared, it can only possibly make it larger. Um, you know, it, it's, it could make it, um, you know, stay the same, uh, but it certainly couldn't make it smaller, which is the important part. So therefore you can see I've got this equality on the boundary that's included, or it's greater than, right? Because you've got x squared plus something versus just x squared. So if this itself is uh, the modulus of z and it's greater than the square root of x squared, then, uh, then I can just say the mod, mod z is greater than or equal to the square root of x squared. Now again, this then led us to the next little bit of um, mathematical precision that we need to look after. The square root of x squared, a lot of people just said that was x, but it's not. If x is a negative number, then the square root of negative five all squared, the square root of negative five all squared is not equal to negative five because we are defining the principal square root here as only the positive one, right? So you cannot simply go from, oh, I'm taking the square root of a square, it just undoes everything. It just becomes x. It doesn't. It becomes the absolute value of x. And in fact, this is one of the definitions. It's the simplest algebraic definition for the absolute value of x. It's what happens when you square and then take the square root. You just get left with the positive value. So you've got here, um, this is, is the correct thing to say from the square root of uh, x squared. But because what this means is, just take the positive value of this, um, take its magnitude regardless of whether it's negative or not. This is likely gonna be equal to x. If x is a positive number, then the absolute value of a positive number is the same as the positive number. Or if x is negative, then the absolute value of that will be obviously larger than the original number. You know, the absolute value of negative five is bigger than negative five. So therefore you can say, well, uh, mod z is bigger than the absolute value of x that's bigger than x. So therefore, if I'm to join the dots, you know, you've got the absolute value of z being bigger than x. So that's where I, I make this line in here. And of course, x by definition, I, I said it right up here, it is the real part of z. So that's how I get this result as required.